Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the other testing that we do. One of the things that we found after having um, done the event in London is we had a few people in, but a lot of the things that um, a lot of the clients came back with feedback is really good, really interested about post-tension structures, but I'm a, I'm a building man and we want to know more about what you do. So this is a talk that I've given quite a bit um, to a number of clients and it really homes in on two types of investigations we do. Some of it will apply to bridges, but this can apply to any other structure that we look at. Um, and initially I'm going to be talking about concrete and looking at concrete. So generally, the two types of investigations we're asked to do with respect to concrete structures, bridges, buildings, dams, ports, piers, anything like this, is the first one generally is an assessment of the structure. So they want to actually know how it's built. And a lot of the techniques we use that I'm going to be discussing now will include the techniques there. Secondly, the one um, a lot of what we get asked to do is not necessarily to do with the assessment of the structure, but to do with the condition. So I wouldn't say they were not really con um, concerned about what was going on, but it was really a case of what's going on with the structure itself. Um, so it was really looking at the concrete, the condition of the concrete. But just as a little bit of an introduction, this is something that we did some time ago. Oh, hang on a minute. To give you... Oh, it didn't obviously play. Anyway, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, could you get the video to play, please? Thank you. This did have sound originally, so I'll narrate. Effectively, this is a building in Reading where we were asked to come along and have a look at the parapet wall right on the top of the roof. There'd been some problems, um, and one of their engineers had said, we think it's leaning. We went up and said, what do you mean by leaning? Well, it looks like it's leaning. Really not a great way of assessing the quality of the structure at high height. We were 10 floors up. So we came in and did an investigation on that using, obviously, um, we had to have some uh, drones in to actually get right the way around the building. Right, I'll crash in so I don't... Anyway, going back to what, what I was getting on to, which is going to be concrete condition testing. Back in the early 90s, the Department of Transport in England put together a number of um, packages for testing companies to get involved with, which by they could then determine and produce some um, guidelines that we could then use, BA3590 being one of them. I'll again try to quickly go through this. So, effectively, these are drawings coming directly out of the DTP advice note, which for us as engineers with respect to bridges, and you, we can relate this back to any other structure, um, the main concern is where concrete is going to be contaminated potentially by, with bridges, de-icing salt. When we look at other structures, anything near the sea, we were looking at a marine environment. So effectively, we would put test panels onto the structure. Now, in some instances, some clients have actually said, we want the whole structure tested. We have done that, and even more recently we've been doing that. But the DTP thought this was a very expensive and long-winded way of trying to get the information from the bridge. So we thought, and I think everybody, certainly within HTA, thought this is a good idea to put test panels to the most critical areas of the bridge. So here we have an abutment which has got a joint above it, so the most likely area of concern will be joints on bridges never work properly, so we're going to have run down at the top. Similarly, this photograph really details a generic photograph of the Midland Links interchange, better known as Spaghetti Junction. That has been tested to death by engineers and then had to be repaired. Um, all of these, the, the crosshead or bent on the Midland Links section of the motorway was considerably um, damaged by de-icing sorts because of defective joints and even the top of the column supporting the beam were also contaminated. The other areas we look at on bridges, and again, this can be applied to buildings and other marine structures, we have splash from the road below. So because we pour hundreds of thousands of tonnes of de-icing salt 
on the roads in the UK every year, a lot of it more so up here than in London, um, when we have rain, the de-icing salt in the road is then splashed into the lower sections of the concrete. So again, here you'd be looking at, if you had an abutment, you might have to actually test high level and low level. And similarly, when we're looking at piers that are in the centre reserve of the motorway or next to the hard shoulder, you need to test them at low level as well. These are going to be the most likely areas of concrete that could suffer from corrosion. We don't do just do one test, we do a suite of tests that we have to overlay on each other and correlate with each other as well. They are very quickly cover meter surveys, half cell potential, linear polarization, extraction of concrete dust samples, carbonation depth measurements, and then we, or we and the structural engineer or consulting engineer, will do an evaluation of the overall risk. I've generally been talking there about the condition testing. Cover meters, though, we do a lot of work, and the photograph on the right is you can see one of our men with a logging cover meter produced by ProSec. Here, this was the building, the post building in London, where Steve mentioned earlier that um, there was a major refurbishment of it. Um, cut the long story short, what we were doing on the last days of the work is they had three floors, um, and each of the slabs on the floors was subdivided up into 150 small slabs, which you can see just on the right hand side. These were three or four metres by three or four metres. So, in essence, we had to test 450 slabs. Now, if you'd have done this with a conventional handheld cover meter that you can see on the top left, we would have been there for months and months and months. But with the, the logging cover meter, we were able to basically do two very quick scans in both directions over the slab and then do a small breakout to calibrate the readings. So, months and months of work were cut down into, I think it was about two and a half weeks. One of the things I must state here is there's a lot of misinformation to do with cover meters. Um, if you want to accurately determine the size of a reinforcing bar in concrete, you have to break it out and look at it and then use the cover meter to calibrate the readings and see if that varies elsewhere on the structure. There are a number of um, companies who purport that you can just use their cover meter and you don't need to break out. Completely false. So if you are needing to do an assessment of a structure and accurately determine the bar size, and in some instances, the bar type, you have to break it out. Anyone tells you you don't, it's incorrect. So although we're discussing a lot of NDT, you do have to um, break out and expose the bar. When we're doing condition testing, we need to break out our bar anyway, because we need to facilitate a connection onto the reinforcing bar to do other non-destructive testing. So it's not as if we, we didn't have to do that. But it's just one of these things, please be very aware. If you're doing an assessment of a structure, one of the companies who produce a certain cover meter that say you don't have to break out is Hilti. And they're the bane of my life, because I've gone along and had to go in and guys are going, no, you just tell me what the cover meter is, what the cover meter says. Hilti, when you push them on it, slightly economical with the truth, it's plus or minus one bar size. So any of the structural engineers here, if I tell you it's a half inch bar, could be 16, could be nine mil. It's gonna have a massive implication if your structure is gonna stand up to an assessment. This is an example of the um, record that can come back with the logging cover meter. So effectively these were spliced straight into our report really quick lots of information there so there you can see we've got a because we've calibrated the cover meter with a breakout the the depth of cover has been confirmed um, and you can get the spacings of the bars these are the two things that Arabs particularly wanted on that contract when we go back to the condition survey type cover meter work here we need to know the bar with the least cover in the test panel the reason being the concrete cover to the bar is the one thing that affords it protection. So I'm not really bothered about how deep the deepest bar is or the average depth of the bar. We want to know the one with the minimum cover. That bar therefore has the minimum protection and could be um, the first bar to be initiated to have corrosion present. So as you saw on the previous drawings, the um, test panels are normally two meters by one meter, so quite a small panel we can get up to do the testing on. Um, within that panel, it's marked up on a half meter grid. We then record the minimum cover, so we'll get eight readings on the grid, and I'll show you an example. 
Once we've done the cover metre survey, we've obviously exposed the bar. We then need to do a half cell potential survey. Half cell potential is an indication of the risk of corrosion of the bar embedded in the concrete. And obviously, we, we've only exposed a two inch section of bar. You've got another two metre square panel to have a look at. This is very much a generic setup of how we take the test. So as you can see, here is a crocodile clip that is clipped onto the reinforcing bar that we've exposed via the breakout. This comes back to a high impedance voltmeter, and we have a, an external half cell. For information, there are normally two types in the UK, a copper copper sulfate or a silver silver chloride half cell. And how this works, the external half cell acts as one half cell, the concrete acts as another one. So a bit like we get a current flow between the nodes on a battery, this is what we're looking at to record here. What I would again say is this is one of the tests that we're UCAS accredited for, and you have to ensure that people know what they're doing and are, are using properly calibrated equipment. If you go down to Halfords and buy a 30 pound cover, uh, multimeter, it will not work. Um, very briefly, and I won't go into too much detail here, but it's to get an idea of why we're testing um, and how we're testing to pick up corrosion of reinforcement. And as Drummond said in the introduction, corrosion is one of the biggest problems we have with any reinforced concrete structures in the UK and elsewhere around the world. Effectively, we have two areas on a reinforcing bar in a piece of concrete that has corrosion present. We have the anodic site or anode, which is where the site of active corrosion is occurring, and we have the cathode, which is the area of the rebar that isn't corroding. Many of you have probably heard of cathodic protection. Cathodic protection has been used initially on um, pipelines and has now been used since the 80s on concrete structures. And the reason it's called cathodic protection is if you remove the concrete around the area that you have an anodic site of corrosion, i.e. you look on a building or a bridge and it's a rust stain exposed bar, if you clean all of that out, put a nice good repair on it, the anode actually protects the cathode. So in removing that anodic site of corrosion, you then allow the anodic site to extend to around the area of the original site of corrosion, i.e. the cathode. That's why we need to protect the cathode. Generally, what you'll see is on bridges or buildings, and we did a lot of work back in the 90s when I was at Taywood Engineering, where we were looking at an elevated um, police station in Blackpool. They had major problems. They had poor construction details, so the bars didn't have a great deal of concrete cover. We got very high half cell readings, which I'll come on to in a minute, which indicate corrosion. We can actually see that. Because it was an elevated structure very near the sea, we had very high levels of chloride in the concrete, all adding up to a lot of problems with corrosion. At the time, the technology on cathodic protection on concrete was in its infancy, and the Lancashire County Council said, we're not going to electrocute our concrete, which was the thing that people said about cathodic protection back then. And so they just did standard repairs. Within 15 months, all the repairs were fine, but all the areas around the repair, a bit like a halo effect, had caused masses twice, two, three times as much corrosion. Um, if you keep going out patch repairing it, you'd have ended up repairing the whole of the police station. So there, they actually then did instigate a cathodic protection system. But effectively, looking at this drawing here, we have the anodic site, which we have a flow of electrons away from the anode to the cathode. That's what we're picking up with half cell potential. So this generally looks like a, I think the, the photograph on the left is from the fourth road bridge. Um, here we have the standard 2v1 panel. We dampen the node points where we take the half cell readings and you can see right in the middle the area where we've actually broken out the bar. On the right, when we have larger areas, we can actually have what they call a potential wheel. Again, another product that's produced by Prosec. This means you can take vast numbers of readings really, really quickly, and these can be downloaded directly to a computer. That's what you get in the report very, very quickly. Effectively, we, we put on the hard data that we record at the node points, which is recorded in millivolts. And again, I'll come on to exactly what that means. The, the readings here is the minimum cover. So from that bridge, you can see that we've got very good concrete cover. We then use a contour plot 
um, to actually console plot the half cell data because with half cell data it's not the absolute values that can be indicative of corrosion it tends to be trends and shifts in the potential which can be sometimes shown far more clearly with a contour plot rather than just raw data. And as you can see, the BO is not body odor, it's breakout, it's where we expose the bar, and the drilling locations is where we've taken drillings. So we try and attempt to put everything we can onto one page, so as a testing house and as a client, you can actually look and oversee that one test panel and decide exactly what's going on. So the assessment for half cell potential criteria was initiated by an American engineer called Van de Veer. This was based upon a lot of studies on concrete bridge decks in the US. Because in the US they do their construction slightly differently from what we do here in the UK, a lot of the bridge decks and the roads over there are concrete. They're not covered by blacktop with waterproofing. And so what Van de Veer did very quickly is he used the technique of half cell potential to take readings. And as you can see here, the readings that we record are millivolts. And generally, the more negative a value you get, the more indicative that you have a high possibility of corrosion occurring. How he worked out this criteria was to do thousands and thousands of readings over thousands of bridge decks. And he then went along and got a team of uh, guys to break out and actually look at the condition of the steel at that node point. So he came to this criteria which stated that if you have readings that are more positive than negative 200 millivolts, there's a 90% probability of no corrosion occurring at all. However, if you have readings more negative than negative 300, 350 millivolts, there's a 90% probability that you have corrosion. However, there are instances where half cells do have certain restrictions and one of them being an increased moisture content in concrete. And to give you a brief example, a number of years ago, we tested a lifeboat station, which had substantial amounts of corrosion just underneath the boathouse in the um, intertidal zone. We were asked, however, to test right the way down the bottom of the ramp to see what the condition of the concrete was there. This piece of concrete or bottom of the ramp area would only be exposed two to four times a year at a very high spring tide and a very low spring tide. Therefore, the concrete was permanently in water, never dried out. Um, and the problem with half cell is, the, like I say, one of the restrictions of the technique is if you get an increased moisture content in the concrete, it can artificially shift the potential. It, you're really using it more as a moisture meter than a corrosion probe, and therefore, where it, because it's completely um, immersed in water and the, and the concrete is saturated, you tend to find there's no oxygen. If you don't have any oxygen at the site of the bar, generally, you don't get corrosion. So it's just one of the issues that we do have to think about as structural engineers. The DTP took the sort of comment I just made there on board and said one of the things we do need to do then is think about possibly correlating half cell potential data with chloride data. Because of that reason, back in the day when, in the late 80s when I was working at Taywoods, they were developing a technique called linear polarization, which is about today. And it's a great shame. We do this a lot on jobs, but it's not really been uniformly accepted by Highways England. What happens here is, and as you can see on the photograph, the chap here is holding a, a standard silver-silver electrode, which would get you your standard half-cell reading. Around it, you can, you can see this, what they call Bigfoot, which is a secondary anode. And what this does is this gets across or, or around the problems that we have with increased moisture content on concrete. And the reason we've got this photograph in here, these are pre-stressed beams on a bridge, and we'd had about a week or two of good weather prior to this job, but you can still see the end of the beam is damp. Highways England were trialing this, and this was probably 10, 15 years ago, and haven't really taken it on board but they knew as soon as we got to the end of the beam with a conventional half cell, we get a shifting, a shifting potential, but they knew that it was probably because of the increased moisture content because you could see the end of the beam was damp. We did it with the LPR kit and it brought in fantastic readings that showed that the actual rate of corrosion at the end of the beam was negligible. 
very briefly, it's not as quick as a half cell. Half cell is virtually instantaneous reading because we're trying to shift the actual half cell, shift the potential on the reinforcement, it takes 60 seconds. So on a, on a standard 2 by one grid, you've got 15 readings, it'll take you 30 seconds. This will take you a minute. So we tend to do less readings with this. And these are the, um, it's like a table of, of it's called an i reading, and it's mu meters per year, which is mu meters of corrosion product that's being produced on the bar. We use it a lot because, as Drummond and the guys have alluded, when we're on site, the most expensive thing is getting us up to the bridge and getting us up a hoist or scaffold to the test panel, to the investigation area. Once we're there, what equipment we throw at the bit of concrete to give us more information about the condition of the concrete really doesn't have any cost implication. So we would say it's better to try and do more testing to give you a far better idea of what's going on because there has been major concrete repair jobs let when the concrete's been in a purely very, very good condition. And all you're doing is you're indicating the concrete's poor because it's damp. But it's damp, there's no oxygen. No oxygen, no corrosion. And we've seen big areas of concrete removed to expose clean, un un um, corroding reinforcing steel. Clients don't really like that, to be perfectly honest. Dust sampling, probably one of the most boring things Drummond and I have done. Thankfully, I don't think Drummond and I have been on the end of a drill for a good number of years. Um, again, we carry out under our UCAS accredited in-house procedure. We take incremental drillings down to normally around about 100 mil. The reason being they're incremental is the chloride ingress is normally an ingressing nature from de-icing salts or from a marine environment. Hence, Generally, you'll find that the highest level of chloride will be on the surface, normally diminishing with depth. More importantly is another te technique or method that can actually cause corrosion to reinforcing bars. Concrete, by its nature, is an alkaline environment. I don't need to tell most of you here that. Um, that alkalinity produces a passive film around the reinforcing bar which protects it. And as long as oxygen and water and that protective alkalinity are not changed, the bar should stand in good stead for a number of years. However, carbonation in the, well, sorry, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can produce a weak acid as it dissolves into concrete, which causes carbonation. The carbonation reduces the alkalinity of the concrete to a point that we can pick it up with an indicator solution. It doesn't make the concrete um, acidic or even neutral. It just reduces the alkalinity of it, which reduces that protective alkalinity and will allow the reinforcing bar to corrode. This is a pretty good example. This is a core we took some time ago. And as you can see, because we've got a large crack in the core, the atmosphere is being able to penetrate down the crack. And what we're looking at is this purple front is the carbonation front. So the purple color of the concrete means that the concrete is still in its full alkaline state and is protecting any bars within it. However, this concrete colored part of the concrete is the carbonated concrete. We use an indicator solution called phenophaline. It's, it's pretty horrible stuff. It's probably one of the worst things we take out on site. Um, as I said, the pink color indicates non-carbonated concrete, I, it's as it should have been. What I would say is if any of you are near any of my guys who are using this, I would say make sure you keep well away from them or certainly upwind because phenophaline in very, very dilute forms is used as a laxative. So you don't want to get a face full of it. People have asked me over the years, can you give us an idea of looking at a piece of concrete? Is it carbonated or is it chloride ingress? It's very difficult because there's always one's going to come, and I'll say it's like that, and it'll bite me on the bum. But generally, what you tend to find is carbonated concrete and the corrosion that you see with it is normally with bars that have low cover, restricted cover. They haven't put in the proper uh, formwork or spacer blocks to, to ensure that the concrete has enough cover. So this is a general shot where, as you can see, exposed reinforcement, it's, it's delaminated the whole top of this, the underside of a soffit. And you can't really see, it's not the best of photographs, but it's quite honeycombed. So when you get honeycomb concrete, 
because you've got voids in the concrete, it means the atmosphere can penetrate down to a depth quite quickly. Chloride, however, you tend to find that the rate of corrosion and the amount of damage on corrosion is, is pretty much a lot higher than you get with carbonated concrete. That previous slide, if that had been due to chloride ingress, you wouldn't have seen any concrete. It would just be a mass, oh, sorry, a mass of corrosion product. So we've been talking about chloride, and again, generally, we have three sources of chloride in concrete. One is de-icing salts from sorting the road. Secondly, from a marine environment. And thirdly, from actually casting chlorides. Drummond has said um, HAC was produced because of its quick setting properties. What would normally happen as well, and it would always be on a Friday afternoon in a casting yard, and I'd spoken to some guys very, very early days in, in my experience of doing this, they would actually have a block of rock salt, halite, in the casting yard, and they would grate this manually into the concrete mix for the last 20, 30 beams they were making. Salt makes concrete set quickly. Why, why would they do this, knowing that you're casting a big problem in? Nine times out of 10, they'd all be back the next morning on Saturday to strip all the formwork down. If it's set quickly, they're in the pub for lunchtime. Otherwise, they're, all, they're there all day. And these things are the things that Stuart was alluding to as well. Poor quality, poor workmanship. These are the things that cause problems. What we have here is, is a risk table for chlorides in concrete. This is related to chlorides that are ingressing, not casting chlorides. And I would say, generally, if we're looking at any sort of structure, if you have above 1% chloride by weight of cement at the bar depth, you've got a problem. There's lots of more information you can read on this. One publication is a Concrete Society technical report. Is it 60? Technical report 60. Or if you want to spend a wee bit more money, um, there's a guy called John Broomfield who we've worked with. And John has been a stalwart with the Concrete Society about putting information of what does all this mean. So, by all means, I'm really ripping through this very, very quickly. These are the sort of things you should be having a look. You can get a lot of this online as well. So once we've all done all of, all of that testing on the concrete, we can then have a chat with the client um, and determine exactly what way forward. Sometimes people just say, just give us the raw information. Others may want us to do recommendations for repairs. And because we're not owned by anybody, we hopefully have a completely sort of unbiased viewpoint. If there's no testing to be done, there's no more testing to be done. If we think you may need to, and one of the things that sometimes comes out is to monitor. Because when we're doing all of this concrete condition testing, it's a snapshot in time. I don't know what's going to happen in weeks to come, months to come, or years to come. However, if you've got a concern, what you can actually do is then embed some monitoring probes, as you can see here, and you can then monitor them over a period of time. This was a, um, a joint on a, the, I think it was the area on the right is a drop-in slab, and it was a supporting slab on the left on a footbridge in Brentwood. They didn't even know that this thing was post-tension, so they were very concerned because there was a lot of corrosion product that you can see just here, which is quite near where the anchors were. So we actually did a bit of a PTSI for them and then Im embedded some probes. Now, to get to this area, we needed to have a road closure, have a, a hoist um, up there as well. We embedded all of this, but I think you maybe just see we actually ground in channels for all the wires, ran it back to a little box um, that was vandal proof, and it meant when we came back to do the monitoring, it was one guy in a van, little, step, a little pair of steps up, plugs in our monitoring equipment, and away we go. So it meant it's a really cheap way of doing it, rather than as some clients will have you do, go back every time and do the same testing again. Very quickly now, that's me pretty finished on um, the concrete condition testing, but it was just to give you a flavor of what other things we do. Um, most of our guys are confined spaces trained, so all of what we've been talking about today sometimes has to be done in a confined space. So they have, they have the, the su sufficient training and equipment for that. Plus, all the easy bridges have been tested. We're tending to get the ones where you need boats, 
And here, the, the large photograph on the right-hand side was of an arch that had some problems. The, the parapet was leaning out. The spandrel walls were in a real shocking state. Um, and we needed to do it from the actual canal. This is a job in London. So as you can see, we put up a, a pontoon whereby we could then put a, a scaffold on board. I was talking to somebody at lunch about um, principal inspections. Principal inspections mean you have to touch every physical piece of the bridge. This is where we can do that now, whereas before it was done from afar with binoculars. And again, the team are trained to erect the scaffolds, use the pontoons, and a number of our guys have had whales of fun ripping up and down the Thames doing the RYA speedboat courses for the safety boat. We've touched a lot on post-tension work, but one of the things we haven't looked at is actually exposing the anchors, which is part of the, one of the revised DTP advice notes on post-tension work. Um, this is something we were asked to do because they had a concern about the anchorages. So here you can see us actually, we've had to expose the ballast wall, take the deck, we had to actually close the road for this for about two or three weeks. Other confined spaces and testing the culvert. I've pretty much talked about concrete, but again, we have, we have seen that we, we do works, and Steve, I think, put a photograph up of the um, Hammersmith Bridge. We do do a lot of work where we have composite structures that consist of steel and concrete. In the past, a lot of clients would have to get a firm to, look to, to do the concrete, a firm to do the steel, maybe a firm to put scaffolds up, maybe a firm to close the road. It goes on and on. We, from a very early stage, realised if we can do all of that, it makes your job easier. And we're all inherently lazy. If I can get one person to do a whole lot of jobs in my house rather than employing seven or eight, I will. This is some other work. We um, are what we call risk approved for work on network rail and other rail infrastructure, including London Underground. And this was actually Dr. Zyke Railway. Here they had a problem with some of the steel work. It was a gull wing um, canopy to the structures here and they were concerned about the support structure and the steel work and were they in good or bad condition. So again, we came in, this is actually one of our chaps doing a CCTV, CCTV survey down one of the drain pipes to ensure that it was in good condition. Hammersmith, as Steve has mentioned, has been closed to cars for a number of months now and we're getting involved with some of the early investigations. Um, what we had here is you can see on the left-hand side a hanger for one of the main chains on the bridge um, and they're looking to actually strengthen it and because it's a listed structure and it's in a poor state we can't take any samples so what we've had to do here is to try to distinguish the material type so what's happened is and these two slides on the right this one here is a typical slide from a raw iron is that right Steve is it raw iron and this was the, the typical slide we were getting from the work on site. So it, it's already bringing into, uh, into question that the bridge is actually constructed by the material types that the client thinks it is. You've seen quite a few photographs of us working at heights. These are the sort of things we do get involved with a lot. Again, you saw part of the video of the Reading House. But again, this is classic work that we have to do, multiple teams working at height on railways, and it's a case of we discuss that job, we were actually allowed two and a half hours work, so there's a hell of a lot of kit to get down onto the bridge, get it up and get working. And how do you get that high up in a building? This is in a bank in the City of London. Because we've been thrown all the awkward oddballs about this, we do have quite a good link with a number of uh, MUP operators and suppliers. Under bridges, where you can't physically get under there. I think Ryan did put a photograph up of some load testing. This was another load test we've done on a core wall and a lift. So these are the other oddball things that we do get involved with. Lastly, I'd like to say, We've gone through loads and loads today about what we do, the techniques, the technology that we use. It's, it's baffling for anybody, any, even for the people who are you know, au fait with exactly a lot of what we do. So what I would say is, 
At the moment, we offer tech days in London, whereby you, your young engineers, or whoever can come down, we all supply lunch and supply a day where you get to play with all our bits of kit. We're moving very shortly into new offices up here in Scotland, and the same offer will be held up here. And in addition, if you want to hear at a slightly less 100 mile an hour pace as Drummond and I had to do today, more about what we do, please ring us up. We're more than happy to come in and do a CPD presentation. And I know that ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of instruction engineers who have to have training for their graduates and themselves. So we are more than happy to do that. And um, we normally pay for lunch. Always a good way to get the graduate engineers there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.